Welcome to Sasquatch Theory. In today's episode, I interview Jacob from Southwest Oklahoma. He is a whitetail hunter who will be telling his Bigfoot story for the first time ever. At the age of 13, Jacob and his friend walked into the woods one day to whitetail hunt when they ran into a clan of Sasquatch who were bent on driving the kids out of the woods. They experienced a lot of activity that day and nothing could prepare them for what they encountered. A high volume of Bigfoot reports I receive are from outdoorsmen who want to know more about what they experienced out in the brush. I want to give a shout out to the people who have contributed by donation or using the super thanks button down below. I really appreciate it and you guys are awesome. Soon you guys will all have the option to become a YouTube member and I hope you guys all consider it. Just keep an eye out, I have a new video coming out soon that will explain everything about the membership. Alright everyone, sorry for boring you with all of that. Let's get into this next Bigfoot encounter from Southwest Oklahoma. Hey Jake, welcome to Sasquatch Theory. I appreciate you being on the show today. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Miguel. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Jake, if you would, tell me about your experience and a little bit of background on where this happened, who you are, and where this all took place at. Of course. Um, my name is Jacob. Uh, I'm originally from southwestern Oklahoma. was born and raised there. Uh, spent most of my time there growing up as well. Uh, this incident takes place back in 2011 when I was only 13 years old. I'm 24 now, so I've gotten some time on my on my hands to kind of figure things out and see where I wanted to go with this because I've had a lot of instances in my life that I can't really explain properly. Uh, and whenever I do try to explain it, I just I'm led to dead ends. Um, but anyways, this takes place back in January of 2011. I was 13 years old, living in Oklahoma, and uh, you are from the Midwest as well, so you know how how the weather gets out there. Um, but in Oklahoma, we are not very used to seeing snow or inclement weather, uh, but this year in particular, it had snowed a decent amount, uh, probably about three or four inches. So for us Okies, that's a you know perfect perfect day. Uh, we got out of school. Um, I had plans for my buddy Lane to come over, and we were just going to go hang out in the woods and have our own time and you know, just use our imagination and have fun. Now, leading up to this, I have never encountered anything like this in my life. Uh, I, I think this encounter has sort of sparked a fascination within my myself about these things that... <laughs> either exist or they don't exist, but I, I'm pretty sure that your listeners, as far as I'm concerned, they undoubtedly know that something is out there, whether mm -hmm. it is a Sasquatch or um, a cryptid of any sort, whether it's a, a skinwalker or a Wendigo. But anyways, I'll take it from here. Lane came over and we sat on about 60 acres of property at the time uh, that my stepfather owned. I worked on a family farm up there. And he came over and we had the intention of going out into the woods and just using our imagination. He brought over some camo gear, 
some dopey to to mask our scent because we had full intentions on seeing uh, bucks. Uh, we have some pretty good sized game in southwestern Oklahoma. Uh, not not incredible game, probably nothing that you're used to seeing up in Missouri, but we are typically used to seeing decent sized bucks. So we had the the grand idea of going out and trying to use our our skills, <laughs> and I, I say that with air quotes, our skills to try to find a buck. But anyways, on this property that we sat on, we had, uh, I want to say an out of commission deer stand because we didn't use it anymore because it was just outdated. Um, but it was good enough and it still sat properly in the tree for it to hold our weight. So we had the intentions of going out, climbing the deer stand and just honestly just hanging out. Uh, you know, being 13, there's really not a whole lot <laughs> that we can do besides use our imagination and have a little fun amongst ourselves so lane came over he brought uh, a buck rack that he had he brought some camo gear and like i said he bought some dopey to mask our scent excuse me and we headed out and so to the deer stand was about about a mile and a half of walking through thick brush and tree lines and just getting to where we needed to go we had an old trail set up so that we could confidently find our way there but over the years that trail has sort of regrown and hidden the path so we brought some uh, flagging tape and we would tie the tape around the trees to kind of breadcrumb our way to and back so we don't get lost and wind up somewhere on someone else's property uh so we went on the trek and we were walking and you know being 13 everything everything is beautiful you know i i believe that our our mind has a way of perceiving things a lot differently than i would i do now uh so that day was just a beautiful day uh there was it was snowing there was a slight breeze you can hear the wildlife in the area everything just felt alive and you could feel that within your bones um i know it sounds weird but you know you're an outdoors guy and i love being outdoors i work outdoors and so being outside and being connected to nature is just this different feeling it's a feeling of you know i wanted to use a different word other than happiness but there's really nothing that can describe it other than just pure tranquility i love being outside and uh so did lane and that's why we got along so well so we did not bring any cell phones we didn't bring anything of that sort so we didn't want to be distracted uh but we made our way into the woods um mile and a half probably took us probably took us about 30 35 minutes because we'd keep getting distracted and just goofing off and having fun and well we finally got to the deer stand and this is where everything just sort of began to just spiral out of control and i don't i don't mean that lightly either um as soon as we got to the deer stand and as soon as we touched it this is kind of like some like a movie uh we we felt this this feeling that we were being watched and trying to put it into words now you know humans we have a sixth sense a lot of people don't agree with that i've spoken to people who don't believe in that but i I do believe that we have a sixth sense It's, it's sort of been pushed away over time that society has advanced because we all live in this this bubble um of of safety perhaps is a good word for it so we don't really have to go out and try to survive and hunt for food so that sixth sense has sort of been put on the back burner well when we got to the deer stand we just we felt uneasy we felt as if (laughs) it's gonna sound funny that we weren't supposed to be there but we kind of pushed it off and we felt that it was just our our nerves or whatever which didn't make sense at the time to 13 year olds because when we felt something is wrong you kind of want to act on that because it just you know like i said that sixth sense is kind of strong so we we put it on the back burner we push it away because we we walked all the way out there we had this plan of going out and having some fun so we weren't just going to quit now because our our tummies were feeling weird so we climb up the deer stand it's probably about 20 25 feet in the tree and it, it's a small stand it, it it fits one person so we had to squeeze up there and uh <laughs> we, we made it work we made it work um, but when we got up there, you know, we didn't really have a game plan. Uh, we just wanted to sit and enjoy the nature. Uh, we began talking about school and sports and football and, you know, stuff like that, video games. 
Lane started racking his his antlers uh, and trying to make <laughs> the best the best impression on a buck that he could make, uh, whether it was high squealed whining. Uh, at times, he sounded more like a rabbit than he did a deer. But anyways, we were having a good time. We were up in the stand, just doing our thing. And what happened next is, is something that has stuck with me for 10 years now. Um, and I, I've, I've, it's weird speaking about it, especially to someone who understands. Because when I try to tell this to my friends or family, they, they kind of blow it off. They don't really think much about it. But the entire woods went quiet. Um, it's as if God turned off the weather effects for this certain area. Uh, the wind stopped blowing, the wildlife stopped chattering, and it was so quiet outside that you could hear your own heartbeat in your ear as if you were laying in your bed with your head on your pillow. And it kind of had that sound of what I relate to stepping in snow. When you step in snow and it crunches, that's sort of what it, it sounds like to me when I put my head on a pillow and you can hear your heartbeat in your ears. It was so quiet that we just looked at each other and we didn't say a word. And so we were quiet for probably about what felt like an hour, but in, in reality, it was more of probably like 10 minutes. And in the background behind us, so we, we, we didn't have a good position to turn our bodies around to look behind the tree. We could only do probably about a 90 degree turn to kind of see below us underneath the deer stand and a little bit behind the tree. But we heard this rhythmic knocking as if it was it was in numbers and it was in rhythm and it was purposely done so um as if you've seen the movie the conjuring uh where the wife is in the basement and she heard the knocking in threes but this wasn't in threes this was nothing like that this was it sounded like that it sounded like someone was knocking on a door but it, it was so loud that it sounded like it was right behind us. Now, in the area that I lived in, we have a lot of birch trees. Um, birch trees, they grow very close together, and they kind of get entangled around each other, and it, it just creates this thick brush. And we were I was thinking to myself, whatever is knocking on a tree, it's not somebody's fist. It couldn't be somebody's fist. It had to have been some sort of tool, hardware, maybe somebody was cutting an using an axe to cut down a tree but even then that didn't make any sense because our closest neighbor was probably two miles down the road uh, so that didn't make any sense unless it was possibly someone just trespassing on our land or whatever the case may be we were thinking all sorts of things at that moment and then we started to notice that it was coming in two different directions so we'd hear a, a group of knockings behind us and then to our right, we'd hear a same group of knockings that was in the opposite pattern. So the original pattern was something like, and then the, the pattern that we hear to the right was something different. And, it, and it's, I don't want to say that at the time being 13, I didn't know what it was. I figured it was like a woodpecker or some sort of bird, but even those sounds are very distinct and it's very easy to distinguish, hey, that's a woodpecker compared to some random person in the woods screwing with us knocking on a tree so we sat there quietly we didn't really think much of it but we knew something was up because we've never heard the woods the forest around us just go completely silent um and that's where i say that we have a sixth sense because at least in me for example something sparked in me i knew deep down that something was off um and I was trying to tell Lane, I was trying to whisper in his ear, but Lane was Lane was scared. I wouldn't say that he was scared, but when he gets nervous or anxious, he gets totally quiet. He doesn't want to talk. He basically turned into a statue, would not move, would not talk to me. Uh, I, I said, Lane, do you think that we should get down from the tree and just go home? He wouldn't answer me, so I, I kind of just sat there in defeat, and we just waited for something else to happen. Now, what happened next... Um, it's it's very weird when I when I tell people this, um, they look at me like I'm goofy. But anyways, being in the woods surrounded by brush and, it, and it's so thick and it's so constricted, it's impossible to get any sort of heavy machinery out there unless you have created a path 
to get in the woods and you continue to tear down trees and so forth. What sounded next was as if a tree or a skid steer, for example, was somewhere around us and it was just continually knocking on a tree. Just boom, boom, boom. And it was it was so loud and it was it was deafening to the point where it sounded like it was right on top of us. Um, like I said, at the time, we had no idea what it was. Uh, we were just we were scared. That's honestly what it was. It was it was just fear. And my my reaction to it was just like Lance. Once we heard that, we both immediately froze. We couldn't move. We couldn't speak. Our, our breathing was shaky. And um, we heard this continuous knocking it wasn't even a knocking at this point it was it was it was a boom it was just boom 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 as if a tree itself has been uprooted and it was just swinging against another tree if you could have if you could picture that in your mind of what it would sound like that's probably the closest you'll get and it was it was still doing it in rhythms that we noticed it would be boom 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 pause boom 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 pause and at this point in my mind, I, I was going to yell. I was going to scream. I was going to be like, hey, you know, you're on private property. You shouldn't be here. But as soon as I opened my mouth to speak, it was as, as if. <sighs> Let me backtrack a little bit. So I, I'm 24 now. Uh, I have some life experience under my belt. I know a lot of stuff that happens in the earth. You know, we all have this this frequency that we all live on. Every living thing on this earth has a frequency that it, it, it vibrates on, you know. And at this point, I didn't know what I was feeling. Could have possibly been a frequency of some sort. But we both started to feel really sick. Um, nauseous. Our ears were ringing. We we couldn't really see straight. And so I had the idea to get down from the deer stand. So I told Lane, I'm like, hey, I'm going to get down. I'm going to get on the ground. I'm going to get my bearings. I'm going to see if I can walk over to the edge of the uh, the edge of the tree line. So where this deer stand sat was there was a feeder right in the middle and we were in this opening clearing so probably the only part on our land that didn't have trees uh every inch so we had a feeder in the middle and then surrounding us was just trees so it was just a circle just a maybe a 10 yard long in diameter circle with the feeder in the middle and so i was going to go to the feeder and i had the bright idea of just banging on the feeder and he was like no you probably shouldn't do that we should stay up here um, he was regretting not bringing his phone. I said, Lane, it's okay. I'm going to go down. I'm going to hit this feeder and I'm going to scream and I'm going to yell it off. I'm going to yell this person off. Because at the time, in my mind at least, I wasn't thinking anything supernatural or, or Sasquatch related. I genuinely thought it was uh, a crackhead on our land trying to steal some stuff because we did have some old equipment out, you know, scattered around in different parts of the land, whether it was copper. Uh, metal fragments, uh, aluminum, stuff like that. And so my mind immediately went to that. So I climbed down the deer stand. I, I get my feet on the ground. And as soon as I turned around to look at the feeder, the the woods comes to life again. Everything comes to life again. It was, it, it was really weird. The wind started blowing on us. We could feel the breeze. We could hear the birds chirping. I was like, all right. So it looks like everything's all right. I look back up lane back up to lane excuse me he he's still not talking it was like he's seeing the ghosts and at this point i didn't know what was up with them um and come to find out that lane lane saw something that i didn't and so he didn't relay that to me just yet so i walk up to the feeder and the feeder is this plastic you know uh the same material that they put in like diesel exhaust fluid canisters just like that thick plastic and so I was banging on the side of this feeder and I was I was yelling and I was like, hey, you need to get out of here. This is private property. You shouldn't be here. And I did that for probably a minute straight. And I was just banging, 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 banging. And I looked back up Lane and Lane's looking at me and he's shaking his head. And I'm like, why are you shaking your head? And he looks straight and I follow his eyes. And probably about 60, 75 yards ahead, there was this tree. And the tree was big enough around that you could see it had some size. It was probably big enough to where you could put your arms around it and interlace your your index finger. You could probably touch your index finger. So it was a pretty good sized tree. And there was something hanging out from the side of it. And so I 
I had a hard time trying to get my eyes to fixate on this thing uh, because there was just so much going on in my head. I looked at it for a brief second, and when I looked back up lane, back up to lane, excuse me, he was white. He was white as a ghost. He wasn't speaking. He wasn't moving. And I looked back to the direction where I saw this thing, and it was gone. And as soon as I made contact to where that thing was, the woods goes quiet again. And at this point, the hair on my neck is standing up, and I'm I'm trying to motion the land to get down from the deer stand because we need to leave. Something is off. We should not be here. Lane was frozen. Lane did not want to move. So I turn around with the intention to hit the deer stand again and just start screaming, cussing at whoever it was to get off our property because I, I was going to say I had a cell phone. You know, I, I know my parents know where I'm at. Like, you're going to be in trouble. But, you know, looking back now, obviously, I didn't have a cell phone, so I was lying. But being young, I, I wasn't prepared for this. So I turned around with intentions on hitting the deer stand. And as soon as I bring my arm up, I, I've tried to recreate the sound for many years, and I, I can't get it right. But it was like, and and it just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Every time it made the noise, it would get deeper and deeper. And the third time it made the noise, it it was deep, but you could still hear it. It was more of like a guttural. I, I can't I can't recreate it for the life of me. But as soon as that third time hit, Lane was Lane was moving. Lane was climbing down the deer stand. He he did not want to be there anymore. And this is where I started to feel queasy again. I did not feel right i felt very lightheaded as if i just became dehydrated out of nowhere lane was climbing down the deer stand and i was i was whispering him whispering at him excuse me telling him to hurry up telling him to hurry up and i was i was starting to get agitated uh angry out of nowhere just just really angry and i was starting to yell at him and when i yelled at him again we heard a we heard a boom just a and he stopped he's probably about six feet off the ground just hugging the ladder to the deer stand um this is the part of the story where people sort of lose interest i guess because i have such a hard time explaining what happens next um we heard a roar um that's the best thing i can explain it 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 was as if a freight train was stuck in the middle of the woods uh, with no one around it it was a long roar um it was like a train mixed in with a lion i i've never found anything that's recreated it i've looked online on google on youtube i i cannot find any sound that is close to even what we heard uh once we heard this roar it probably lasted about four or five seconds it wasn't very long but it was it was so loud with the woods being dead silent that everything around us just told us to run. Um, that was my instinct. I I went up behind lane and I pulled the bottom of his shirt off of the the ladder. I pulled him off the ladder. He fell onto the ground and I I expected him to be angry, but I I picked him up and he, he kind of pushed me off of him and he said that we need to run. So we dropped everything that we had. We dropped the, the antlers, uh, the bottle of dope and we, we took off running and so when we went running back in the direction that we came, we tried to find uh, the flag tape that we had set around the trees to breadcrumb our way back. And at this point, I don't know if it was just delusion or in our in our in our fear stricken minds that we had just lost sight of the colors, um, which I don't think that we did because we used a bright yellow tape to wrap around these trees and the yellow tape kind of offset the white so you could definitely see the yellow uh, compared to everything around us which was white and just dead we couldn't find it at all Um, so at this point we're freaking out excuse me and we ran back to the direction that we thought was my house and we ran Um, only, only a couple times in my life have I ever been filled with so much adrenaline that I felt like I could run and run and run and run without being winded or tired. Uh, we ran straight. That was our best bet. We tried to not zigzag or cut any sharp corners that would get us screwed. We ran back using our intuition of where we believed that we came from. And we ran and we ran and we, we hit this fence line. 
And as soon as we hit this barbed wire fence, we knew that we had messed up because we didn't cross a barbed wire fence to get here. So at this point, I'm I'm sort of losing my mind. Lane is he's hyperventilating to the point where he can't really he's not really um he's not there, I guess. He he's not there with me mentally. He he's scared. I'm very scared. Um I'm not trying to sound like a leader of the pack here. We were both very frightened. Um so we looked back behind us. We couldn't see anything. We couldn't hear anything. The woods was still quiet. So we went under the fence and we continued to just move straight just to our 12 o'clock. And we kept running. Uh, at this time, it was probably probably high noon. Uh, it wasn't very late in the day. Um, it was just afternoon. And we were running and we were running and we came down to this this ravine. It was this creek that had dried up, um, but it, it created this this cavern of sorts uh erosion had kind of struck away everything in the in the river so there was there was points to it where it was pretty deep that if you get down deep into the river you couldn't see up over it and so we had the idea of jumping in the river to get our breath and just kind of sit there and chill out so we can figure out what's going on we get down to the river we're breathing lane's freaking out at this point lane's trying to tell me that he saw something and you know i didn't want to hear it i was scared i was like let's just try to get our breath we need to run home and he wasn't having it he he pulled my collar of my shirt and pulled me around and he's like jake i i saw something out there i don't know what it was and at this point he's telling me that he saw a head sticking out from behind the tree and it was sort of bobbing back and forth like a buoy in the water and it had this this rhythmic motion and it just kept peeking its head out Sometimes it would stick his head out in longer intervals and then peek its head back in. I was trying to ask him, I'm like, was it a person? Did they have camo gear on? Were they wearing any orange? Was it possible that it was a person? What was it? He said, I don't know. It was just really dark. I didn't see anything. It was just like a figure. And I was like, all right, well, it could have been a black bear, which black bears aren't too common in oklahoma there are small populations we we did live right next to a wildlife refuge uh the wichita wildlife refuge um so it could have been possible that a bear had escaped but even then they are they're they're heavily tracked they all the animals in the refuge have a tracker that the the game wardens use to track these things so if they were to get out of a particular area then they would be you know reprimanded they would have been captured and brought back so to put it in perspective we were probably about 35 miles away from this refuge which seems like a lot on foot to a person but to a bear or any other animal that's that's a cakewalk you know animals are used to traveling long distances so this is just something normal so i didn't think anything of it i was like okay if it is a bear we need to get as far away from it as possible because we're not going to fight a black bear this isn't you know, we're not Leonardo DiCaprio. There's no way that we're going to be able to face off against a 400-pound black bear. So at this point, as soon as he said that, I was like, okay, we need to keep moving. We need to keep running. And we need to find our nearest a house. We need to do something. And so he was like, okay. And so we, we climb out of the river, or we, we make our attempt to climb out of the river. Sorry. Um, since it had just snowed, the soil was really loose and it was wet and muddy. So we had a pretty difficult time of climbing out of that ravine. So instead of cutting back across the river, we try to walk down the river some to find some low point so we can get out. And we make that decision. So we're walking down the river. And at this point, you know, he brings up, why is it so quiet? Um, I didn't have an answer for him. I, I said, I don't know. I've never seen this before in my life. And he was scared. Of course, I was too. So we keep trucking along this path. And we we get to this this opening. Um, it's weird. It's, it's weird talking about this. I haven't really spoke about this story in a while. So I'm getting a lot of... Uh... Anyways, we get to this opening into the river where it's a flatbed. To where the, the ground is flat around us in all in all areas and uh we see a deer <clears throat> it was a doe it was a fairly young doe um the deer was dead um you could smell it we've 
that's the first thing that hit us was just the stench um and a dead animal it's you know it's nothing it doesn't smell good at all i didn't want to walk up to it because i have a weak stomach so i was having a hard time with the smell lane was doing all right so lane walks up to it and i'm probably about 20 feet behind him and have my nose on my shirt and he's looking at it and miguel when i tell you this um i mean this with a hundred percent honesty it, it looked like that deer had a, a xenomorph from alien pop out of its stomach it, its stomach was ripped open as if it was not surgically done it wasn't like a perfect in like a perfect rip it looked like it was a bit open to a point to where the insides were sort of just eaten and and dealt with now when we saw this i didn't try, i didn't have any inclination of equating this deer to the thing that lane saw uh i figured it was a mountain lion because mountain lions are are common in oklahoma but they're not again it's just like the black bear they're not as they're not as drawn out because we have in oklahoma we have we have game wardens who try to control the population of deer as far as mountain lions every couple years they they release mountain lions to control the deer population and then they control the mountain lion population with hunters you can get special attacks to hunt these things and so my mind went directly to a mountain lion but if you're familiar with cougars you, you know that they they typically go for the throat of their animals uh, so this deer its throat was perfectly intact um there were no other blemishes no cuts no no deep in like no deep wounds anywhere other than its stomach it was laying on its left side and its stomach was just ripped open uh there were no insides that i could see um it was all it was probably a couple days old it had that stench to it but we didn't stay long enough to you know start an investigation or some sort so we were already struck with fear so we kept running and we ran and we ran and we we found this shed and this shed belonged to our neighbor and this shed sat it was an old shed probably from the 60s uh it was decrepit it was just old aluminum it was falling apart so we get to this shed and i tell lane i'm like hey i know where we're at we need to follow this trail and it'll take us to our neighbors his name is michael and so we get to the shed and we're breathing we're trying to to gather ourselves and at this time the forest picks back up um the silence goes away the the wildlife starts to chatter again you can sort of feel everything alive and so that that made us feel a little better because the feeling in our stomachs was gone we weren't feeling scared or anxious uh the hair on my neck wasn't sticking up so we had we had a place to kind of relax and gather our thoughts so we can create a game plan to get home and so we're sitting there and lane's talking to me and he's like that thing that i saw behind the tree was really big and i said what do you mean i thought you said you could only see part of its you know part of the figure and he's like no man that that thing was halfway up the tree i'm like so could it have been a bear and he's like i don't know i've i don't know and so i was like okay okay so in my mind it's a bear and he was just scared and didn't know what he saw because it was just in the moment so in my mind this is a bear and nothing else so i felt a little better knowing that black bears they're not very territorial um they're curious but they're not going to charge you like a brown bear or a kodiak bear would they're not just going to run you down and eat you uh they're more scared of you than <laughs> you are of it essentially and so i felt a little better about that but at the same time i never heard a bear make the noises that we heard um at all uh, i've heard a bear roar and a brown bear a brown bear doesn't really roar it, it makes grunting sounds and calls but nothing on the edge or excuse me on the verge of what we heard so we were getting our breath and we began to walk down the riverbed and this riverbed opens up to just open land uh so we're walking down this this path and it, it is a path because on either side of us there's this old wooden fence that has sort of just molded and crumbled into the ground but enough of its shape was still there that we could follow it 
And so we follow it and we follow it what felt like an hour and we get to my neighbor's house and he was outside doing something um, work. I don't know what he was doing, but he was doing something and he sees us coming from the tree line and I yell out to him. I said, Michael, hey, can you take us home? And he's like, what are you doing over here? And I told him, I said, hey, we went to the deer stand. We were going to have some fun, but we heard a lot of stuff that freaked us out. And he looked at me and he raised his eyebrow and he said, what'd you hear? And I looked at Lane and Lane shook his head. Lane didn't want me to tell him. Um, And honestly, to be honest, I didn't want to tell him either. Because at this point, I knew that being 13, no one was going to believe me. But I told him what we had heard. And he puts down... uh, whatever he was holding and he he grabbed me like by he didn't grab me but he put his arm on my shoulder and he's like listen you do not need to go back there alone anymore you don't need to do it and so i looked at lane and we walked away with michael and we got in his truck and we were driving out of his driveway and everything was quiet michael wasn't talking lane wasn't talking and I, i was sitting there and i looked at michael and i'm like why can't we go back there alone He's like, if you go back there, you need to have a cell phone. And I'm like, why? And he's like, so what happens to you doesn't happen again. Uh, we got home, uh, told my mom what had happened, and she immediately hopped on the imagination train. She told me that it was a black bear. And, you know, I tried to tell her, like, we, that wasn't a black bear. And she was like, how do you know? You've never seen one in person, which she was right. But this goes back to that that sixth sense in a way. Um, since I never directly saw it, I tried to tell Lane, like, Hey, was this a bear? Like, was this, are you sure this wasn't a bear? And he didn't have an answer for me. Um, I tried telling her about the roar and the sounds that we heard. Um, she just chalked it up to imagination. Now my life continued on pretty normal after that. Um, about three years ago. Uh, Before Michael moved from the property, I had the opportunity to sit down with him and I asked him, I said, hey, do you remember when we came out of the woods when I was 13 and you gave me a ride back home? He said, yep. And I said, what was that? He's like, he looked at me and he just let out a big sigh and he's like, Bubba, I don't know if you want to know what that was. And I'm like, was it a Bigfoot? And he looked at me as if he was shocked and he goes. I think it was Bubba. And I told him everything from what I heard, from what I felt, from what I saw. And he was the only person that believed me. And I believe that because of his, his compassion and his, and his feeling towards me of, of belief and that he took the time to listen to me, it, it really opened my eyes to this whole, this whole world that, a lot of people don't really get to to witness and to that day i've i've had many encounters i don't want to go into detail i don't want this video to be longer than it needs to be um but i've had other encounters and i've been able to take a step back and think to myself hey this could be this this could be that and i've tried to use uh what's the word I've tried to use my brain to cancel things out. So I'm like, okay, if this is that, then it's not that, and so forth and so forth. Yeah. Have have you had an actual sighting after this where you saw the creature? Yes, but it wasn't in Oklahoma, uh, surprisingly. Um, I've only seen something once, and this was in Arizona, of all places. Um, this happened in 2018 when I was 19. Uh, I was living in Arizona at the time with my childhood friend, Corbin. Um, It was in central Arizona, so about two hours north of Phoenix, but about two hours south of Flagstaff. So, you know, Arizona has two different biomes. You have the northern part of Arizona, which is mountainous and snowy. Then the southern half of Arizona gets really hot and it doesn't really have inclement weather. We were in this area called Payson which is right dab and right smack dab in the middle of Arizona. Anyways, I was living out there. This was just before Thanksgiving in 2018. Uh, me, Corbin and some of his friends 
because he is originally from Arizona. So I didn't know any of his friends when I moved out there. But he was like, hey, you should come out with us tonight. We're going to go to Cracker Barrel. Uh, not the restaurant. Cracker Barrel is a, a trailhead off the, uh, the Tonto National Forest in Arizona. It was a trail that kind of dipped three or four miles into the brush uh, in, in the middle of in the middle of nowhere literally um we had the intentions of going out and making a bonfire and drinking and have a good time uh and i was all for that you know i love the outdoors i like alcohol i like playing my guitar and singing and just hanging out so we got out to the trail um it's probably about 10 o'clock at night there's me corbin alex caleb and like three four girls i don't remember their names uh, this is probably about 10 of us there. We get the fire set up. And at this point in time, I was I kind of gave myself the role of the, the firewood guy. So I would go out and get the firewood because I like to I like to be familiar. I like to familiarize myself with my surroundings and where I go. So I will make the time to put on a headlamp and go survey the area so I know where I'm at just in case anything were to happen, whether, you know, anything, not necessarily supernatural esque or anything like that just just for my own safety and for me to feel good about where i'm at so um i haven't told this story before either so you are the first person to hear this story um i'm i'm out gathering firewood um nothing major just bundles of sticks anything i could find and i i venture off the path so we had the fire set up we had a fire log um that they had started to ignite for whatever reason and I, I told them not to do it i'm like that log is to be put with other wood so it can create a fire because that log's not going to burn very well by itself they didn't listen to me they start the fire and the way this trailhead is set up it's it's in a it's in a ravine an old ravine so the old ravine has been makeshifted into a trail and there was about a circle um, a circle head to the end of the trail. So it, it was made for bonfires. Just the trail ended right there. And there was a, you know, a big circle clearing for us to put our stuff, our our foldable chairs, our jukebox, whatever you want to set out there. So I, I venture off into the, into the other half of the ravine to start picking up sticks and leaves and anything I could find that we could burn. And I, I walk out a little farther than I intended to, but it was, it was, it was a quiet night. There wasn't any, there wasn't any wind. It was it was nothing like it was in Oklahoma when I was young, and I and I had that I had that feeling that I knew it wasn't because I felt safe. I knew my friends were you know 200 yards away from me, and I can hear them laughing and I can hear the music. So I was just enjoying myself, enjoying nature, and I was gathering this firewood. And man, I don't I I don't know how to describe what happens next. I've never told anyone this story. So forgive me if, if I'm a little rattly with it, but I had got a bundle of sticks and I had used a, um, a bungee cord, like a bungee cable to wrap it, to keep it together. And I, I set that sticks down and I had to go behind a tree to relieve myself. And so I walk behind a tree to, to, to pee and I hear Corbin's voice behind me. He said, Hey man, you need to come look at this. So I was like, okay, give me a second, you know, I'm peeing when I'm done, I'll, I'll come over there and I'm peeing and he gets pretty persistent. He's like, Hey, you need to come look at this like right now. And he was starting to get snappy with me. And so I, I turned my shoulder around to tell him to, to, you know, shut the F up and leave me alone while I'm peeing. I'll come over there in a second. And when I turned my head around and I made eye contact with a fire, I saw that Corbin was <laughs> Corbin was still at the fire. And, uh, at this point, you know, I, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I, I, I kind of started crying because I know that I didn't imagine that at all. I was completely sober. I haven't drinking anything at this point. I was the firewood guy. You know, I don't want to be intoxicated going to look for firewood because that's not going to be a good story. And when I turned my head around and I, I just caught a glimpse of the fire, and I, I saw Corbin was still standing there. I froze, man, and, and this is something that I wish I didn't do because I, I should have just ran, but I, I froze there with, you know, my, my pants down and just a, a bad situation, and I didn't turn around. I didn't turn around at all. I, I was I was petrified. I 
I literally couldn't move. So I did the only thing I knew what to do. And I, I started praying. Um, in my head, I started praying, telling God, like, please keep me safe. Whatever is about to happen, just know that I'm I'm ready for it. And I'm, I'm sorry. And I was basically just, <laughs> um, I was just praying, you know. And when I felt comfortable enough to, to pull my pants up, man, I, I, I pulled them up. And I, I still sat there. My my left arm was leaning on the tree, and I was I was basically just telling myself to get ready. Like whatever is about to happen, just know that your friends are very close, so you can just scream, and they're they're gonna run over here. And so I I took my hand off the tree, and I I turned around really fast because I just wanted to be ready. When I turned around, I didn't see anything. And so at this point, I was man. I thought I fought with myself about this for so long. I. I told myself, like, are you crazy? Like, are you are you hearing stuff now? And I sat there for a second. And I didn't see anything. And my my feeling, or excuse me, my anxiety sort of just dissipated. And I was able to recatch my breath, man. And I bent down to pick up the sticks. And when I bent down and I was bending back up, I looked up and just up the tree line. So we were down in this ravine. So everything around us was just high ground. We were in this hole, this valley of sorts. Everything around us was high ground. And I lifted my head up and I looked just to the 12 o'clock of me. And man, uh, probably like 60, 70 yards, this, this stench just hit me. And I, I looked up and I saw this thing and it was, it was like a reddish, like a ginger. It wasn't like a bright red, but it was like this tan coyote brown looking thing and i I knew that it was a thing because it was poking its itself around the corner and i saw its shoulders and the shoulders were very broad and very and very sharp and they were protruding pretty aggressively i don't i don't know if that's a good word for it but i knew that whatever was looking at me was was ready it wasn't just standing there curious it was it was ready just in case and i i looked up a little farther and i I saw its face, um, only half of its face, but I saw its eyes, and its eyes were sort of sunken in, and they were at a, an aggressive angle, and I I don't know if that's a good term to put it as far as aggressive angle, but it, it looked as if it was 100% fixated on me, and when I smelled this stench that I assumed it was protruding, I dropped the sticks, man, and I, 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 I ran, and at this point in time, I'm I'm screaming at my friends. I'm like I'm screaming bloody murder. Um, I look back behind me and I look back in front of me and I trip and I fall just like a horror movie. And I'm sort of backpedaling on my butt, but I'm looking to the direction of where I saw it from and I'm I'm hysterical at this point. And so my friends they come over and they help me up and they're asking me like what did you what's going on like what what are you doing excuse me and I, I told them what i had saw and they just start laughing at me man and they they asked me if i was drunk um if i had you know drank anything or if i've taken anything and i said no i was i was sober you know I, I drove out here you guys saw me not drink anything and they dude it was just a rough night um i was scared to death i didn't leave the fire at all for the rest of the night i stayed right there and my eyes were always just shooting across everywhere and they made fun of me, man. I I know what I saw. I know what I smelled. And I tried telling Corbin because I could confide in him. Um, at that point in time, he didn't really want to hear it. I didn't try to tell him for a couple days after that. But when I told him that it mocked my voice, or excuse me, it mocked his voice, and it sounded just like him, he told me not to talk about it anymore. Um, I didn't know why. He didn't really give me an answer, and I felt defeated and disrespected because I thought my friend would want to hear what I had to say, but that was the only time I've ever seen something uh, and, and smelled it. It smelled horrible. I I can't describe it. It smelled worse than a dead animal. Um, it smelled like a skunk, I guess. That's the best way I can describe it, a skunk on steroids. Um but yeah, Miguel, I've I've never told anyone that story, so forgive me. But but yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that with me and sharing it on the channel. 
So going back to Southwest Oklahoma, when you and your friend Lane were up in the deer stand, you heard rock clacking or some type of knocking in a communication type form. What do you think they were saying to one to one another? You know, as I've gotten older and I've, I've garnered more information and knowledge to what these things are, I, I personally think that they were just letting each other know that I was, that we were there. Um, for, so how I felt in the second experience compared to the first experience, the first experience, I did not have any feeling of like, I'm in danger. I mean, I was scared. Don't get me wrong because I was, I didn't know what was going on. So I was a kid. So I was just frightened and Lane being scared kind of just radiated that energy towards me. And so I wasn't being, I wasn't able to use my head properly, but I did not feel in danger. I felt as if, sounds weird. I I felt like as if I was on someone else's property, (laughs) even though it was my property, that's what it felt like to me. I, I think looking back now, the knocks that we heard were, was a form of communication between those two letting us know we were there. That's the only way I can picture it and describe it because I felt like, I don't know, you know, no one's, no one's ever asked me that before. And I've, I've, I've had the time, you know, 10 years to to think about it. And I, I genuinely think that it was just communication between if, I don't know if there were two there or if there were three there, um, for all I know, heck, for all I know, the the knocking could have just been from one one of them, um, but I don't I don't think it was unless they have the ability to move and basically disappear and teleport to one area to the next without hearing anything. Um, but I I do think it was communication with them to each other, knowing that they have eyes on us and that they see us. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like they communicate with one another, and the rock clacking and wood knocking is them saying human danger you know there's a there are hunters in the area or there's people in the area and it seems to be some type of morse code for them and they understand the the language they have multiple languages whether it's the structures actually talking animal sounds and rock clacking wood knocking that that's the most that is the wildest thing to me um you know i i've I watch a lot of people in regards to this sort of stuff. I watch Sasquatch Theory a lot. Um, I'm I'm up to date on like Les Stroud. I was a big Survivor Man fan growing up. I'm a huge fan of Les Stroud, and he has some videos um, on YouTube regarding this sort of scenario. And in my life, I've ne- I've tried to recreate those sounds since then. I just want to point this out. I've, I've used everything from a rebar, a hammer, to anything with weight that I could use to hit against a tree to get that same sound. And it, nothing, nothing could recreate it. It was as if a tree was uprooted and used to swing and hit another tree. Whatever that booming sound was had so much weight to it that there was no way it could have been a human just messing around unless you were like a seven foot tall weightlifting champion. I just, I don't see it. And that is that's what stuck with me all these years. Cause that's the sound I hear in my head, just the loud boom and the forest being quiet sort of helped radiate that sound because there, there wasn't wind, there wasn't wildlife. It was just us and our, our fear. Yeah. And it is typical that the Sasquatch will move in threes. It seems like they're able to watch each other's backs and it's a better way to hunt for them. Man, so um, since I have you on here, mm-hmm. is it is it normal to hear? Well, you know, I I know the answer to this. I don't know why I'm asking, but I I just need sort of uh, affirmation from someone else who's invested in this, just like I am. the The noises that we heard, the vocalizations that I heard, is that normal? Is that something that's usually equated to Sasquatch? Yeah, yeah, it is, and um, it's more normal for them to do the morse code like the wood knocking and the rock clacking um as far as them actually being vocal you and your friend walked into an active area which means they are daylight active and 
they're not just coming out at nighttime, if that makes sense. Man, that that honest I, I my the hair on my neck is just standing up right now trying to to think about it. And I've I've never heard vocalizations like that before or since then, excuse me. Um thankfully, I don't know what I'd do if I was ever put in that scenario again, I'd probably freak out. But it 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 sounded like and I'm gonna say this because I don't know how else to describe it, it sounded like they all vocalized in unison at the same time because it was so loud it sounded like it was coming from all directions and i don't know if that's something they typically do but it was as if i was wearing headphones and i could hear it in surround sound mode that's the best way i can describe it um that's what terrified us the most because it was in all directions but it was at the same time um and that that's what i can't really describe it's just the the deep vocalizations that i cannot recreate myself i've I've YouTubed everything from the the Sierra sounds in the 70s that those guys recorded when they were hunting of the the Sasquatches talking to each other. It sounded nothing like that. This sounded like a whole different breed or whatever the case may be, but I've never been able to hear a sound like it again. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. And I'll try to find a match for what you heard. I know several researchers and their stuff isn't necessarily public, but it's out there and I'll try to send that to you to see what you think. Um, yeah, the rock clacking is very common for whitetail hunters or hunters in general. And, you know, they want to warn each other that there's human danger. I want to tell you about an incident that I had one time while I was bow hunting. I went down to the creek bottom over here by my house and I set up this XOP hang on stand and I couldn't find a good tree because in this creek bottom like every single tree is like crooked or there happens to be another tree in front of you that blocks your shooting lane so what i ended up doing was just setting up this hang on stand about three and a half feet up in this tree which was kind of high up because i was up on a hill looking down to the creek bottom so i could see a pretty long ways well i finally got it set up and I didn't think I was going to see much because I walked all over and left my scent back and forth trying to find a good tree. Finally, I got situated and it was about three in the day. And all of a sudden I hear this vocalization and it sounded like what you described a freight train. It was the loudest whoop I've ever heard. It was just, it was like, I don't know, like sonic boom, like a sonic boom. It was that loud. And it just started off like whoo, like a whoop, like you know when that sonic yes. boom happens and it booms like it was like that and it it really shook me up i got all my stuff out i took down my stand and got out of there uh, um a, a tornado siren now that i think about it it it, it kind of resembled a tornado siren it, it started off very low and it got to this this focal point this high point and it, it stayed there for a couple of seconds and it came back down again. So it was, it had lows and highs to it, but it, it, you're right. It sounded like this sonic boom and it was so loud that oh man, I, I can't describe it. That's, I, I can't believe I've never thought of that before. Uh, it was like a siren. Mm -hmm. Like a tornado siren, sonic boom and mixed with what you described the lion and um, whatever else. It, it was crazy. <laughs> Oh man, you did the good thing getting out of there. I I would not have stayed. I mean, I I was 13, man. I was I had nightmares after that for a long time. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'm 24 now, and sometimes I still have night terrors uh, because I'm I'm so I'm gonna say it. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with uh, cryptozoology. I'm obsessed with all this stuff. I I constantly research stuff. There is a a YouTuber I watch, uh, Bob Gimlin. I'm sure you're aware of who he is. And he does a lot of fascinating videos on these topics. And he had a video uh, where he described a, a sound and he tried to recreate it using software. And it was, man, it, it, it it's just, sorry, I can't really create words because only so many people know what I'm talking about. And it was just a rough time, man. I'm, I hope to God I never hear it again. <laughs> I, I really do unless i have like a 30 out six with me or something powerful i i hope to never hear that again yeah it sounds like they were trying to drive you guys out of the area 
And um, do you think you were being hit with infrasound? Researchers call it being zapped. Do you think that's what happened to you? 100%. And I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because, um, like I said, everything on this planet has uh, a resonant frequency that we that everything lives to, whether it's inanimate or it's an actual living thing. We all vibrate on a frequency. Um, I, I found out that tigers have the ability to emit a 20 hertz frequency to stun their prey. And when I found that out, I immediately knew that what was happening to us was definitely animal. It was an animal. It was a creature of some kind because uh, even in Arizona, I didn't get discombobulated by that that feeling of sickness or or nausea. I didn't get that. The only thing I got that affected my senses was just the smell, uh, the smell of the creature. But I, I definitely do think that I was hit with some sort of frequency to kind of confuse us and I, it worked very well to the point to where we ran the complete opposite direction um come to find out our flag tape was still there we were so scared and stressed out we had went the opposite direction we ran completely away from where our tape was set up and i i think that they knew that we were setting up tape and they didn't want us running back that direction I could be wrong. I don't know if it was just complete hysteria, and that's why we ran the, the opposite direction. Maybe they wanted us to find the deer. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it in that depth as much, uh, but there is a, a possibility that that's probably what happened. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. Well, when I was having activity... I thought it was crackheads because there was crackheads around. And you mentioned that too. You know, you think that it's like spirits out in the woods or like crackheads or some type of squatter. You know, you get that type of feeling, but whatever it is never presents itself. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, what time of year did this happen? I guess it had this, been in the fall, huh? Um, No, this was actually in the beginning of 2011. This was at the end of January. So it was around this okay. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that. Um, you, you heard a loud boom and you mentioned earlier that it sounded like it took like a tree and smashed it against another one because you couldn't recreate it. Right? No. So how we described the sound to each other was a skid, a skid steer, uh, as if a skid steer was out there using its, its bucket to just repeatedly hit against a tree. In my mind, I feel like that could possibly be recreated. Um, but even then with the woods being as quiet as it was, you'd be able to hear that diesel engine in idle. You'd be able to hear it. Uh, we didn't hear anything mechanical. We just heard the boom, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is um, something that's associated with Bigfoot activity. You hear these loud metal bangs out in the woods, and there's no metal out there sometimes, and it's like, what the heck? And it's just like you described, like a bucket hitting like a tree or like trying to shake dirt loose, but there's no engine sound out there. And I think the most fascinating part is we didn't see any tracking. Um, when we approached the deer, we didn't see any tracks that were out of the ordinary. That's why I thought it was a mountain lion at that point. And at, this, and at that point when I was 13, I didn't – I had my mindset that it was a cougar. Growing up, getting more info on the world and just wildlife, I found out that cougars typically go for the neck of deer and that's how they take down their prey and looking back now that deer was from the stomach up it was perfect there there was nothing on the deer that could have identified what could have killed it um so at that point in time i was like okay it was a cougar we need to get out of here um but yeah looking back now man i don't know i i don't know if whatever it was wanted us to stumble across the deer uh, and if it did it was very intelligent and use that as just an extra point to get us scared to get out of there mm -hmm. well from this day forward you will no longer say it was possibly a bear or a mountain lion because a bear is not going to knock and communicate with another bear and the loud banging sounds that you heard that's not something that's associated with bears the whoops that you heard the loud freight train mixed with a lion tornado siren sound that's not a bear you know if a bear smells you 
he's going to dip out and get out of there and you're never even going to know it. And same with a mountain lion. Now mountain lions do have the ability to produce the infrasound to stun their prey, just like tigers, but it's the same deal. You know, they're not going to try to drive you out of an area. Yeah. And they are, uh, they're, they're tan, you know, um, I never saw what lame saw, but to this day, I, I spoke to lean yesterday cause I wanted to, uh, kind of compile evidence not just from him and me but uh from other people from other friends i posted a um a story on snapchat you know and regarding i said hey does anybody have any freaky incidents that they can't explain regarding sounds smells anything that you've seen before and i i hit lean up and i asked him i said hey you know i wanted just to reiterate everything that he said to me before i came on here so i can you know uh correctly portray what he witnessed and he said man it was black it was the darkest color you can think of um he he swears up and down he didn't see a face he didn't see any facial uh features um but what he saw definitely was a bear it, it what he told me is it looked like a portal uh and i know that sounds goofy but it was that dark it just looked like a black hole yeah i'm glad well, i didn't um, see it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess you can just claim that what you experience is something unknown. It's definitely not a bear or a mountain lion, but you experience something out of the ordinary that shouldn't be there. Yes, sir. And something else I want to bring up. Uh, when I was in Arizona and I and I heard Corbin talk to me when he wasn't near me, I I don't have an exclamation an explanation for that. Excuse me. I. I've never heard any stories of, at least to my knowledge, where people's voices that they, or excuse me, people that know other people's voices are mimicked to them. I've never encountered that uh, online. And so I have a hard time telling people, like, that's what I heard. That's what happened. Um, have you heard of anything like that happening where people hear other people's voices being mimicked to them? Yeah, I mean, one time I was playing PlayStation 3 with one of my friends, and I heard his sister's voice in my ear. You know, she said, Miguel, right in my ear. And I looked over and said, what? And there was nobody there. And um, But I wasn't, like, in a bad situation. Hindsight, you know, I shouldn't have been hanging out with that family. You know, they kind of led me down the wrong path, and, you know, it was my fault for being there. But I could never find any an, an, an answer for that. But in your case... You know, with your friends being over there by the fire all together, it seems like there was some type of being or spirit or whatever you want to call it, guardian angel, that was trying to guide you back to your friend. You know, and that there was something there that was dangerous, and I think something was trying to help you. You know, and there are things in this world that we can't explain that happen to us, and it doesn't happen every day. It doesn't mean you're psychic. It, you know, can happen to a person once in their life or many times, but in this instance, there was something otherworldly trying to tell you to get out of there and go back to your friend, I think. Oh, you just you just sent chills up my entire body. I've never thought of it like that. I've always equated that to being what I saw and smelled. I had never thought it could have been something trying to protect me. So that's a that's a good outlook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, when you go out into the wilderness in areas where the Sasquatch are actually at and you start a fire like that and there's girls talking, everybody's talking loud, these things are going to come up and check you guys out and see what's going on. So it's no surprise to me that when you split off from the group, you experience what you did. And it's a shame that they didn't believe you and that they made fun of you. And I'm sorry to hear that, man. You know, it's, it, if I were in their shoes, I don't, I don't blame them. Um, you know, probably I, scared I, them more than anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause I, I wouldn't, I didn't want to ruin their night. And I could tell that after that, the vibe was weird. Um, mm -hmm people looking at me strange so I, I don't blame them for any reason whatsoever but i i do have something else i want to bring up um this is kind of out of the ordinary but i want to ask you real quick have you ever seen a buck stand up on two legs mm, the only time i have is when um i placed a bad shot and hit it in the neck and yeah it it stood up on two legs for a while and before it took off but so what would you see what happened so this this happened when i was nine and i don't know if this is related um but this also happened in oklahoma 
um, I was nine years old and my biological father owned some property um, and it was sectioned off pretty well. We lived on three acres at the time, but to the right of us, to our to our property, we had some land next to us and the, the guy owned cattle and he had a bull and the bull was really friendly. I mean, it was like a big dog. Um, I can call it, I could be like, come here and then the bull would come up to the fence and I'd be petting it. Well, anyways, I bring this up because this has sort of just been in my mind for years. I don't really think about it often. I don't know why it just came to me right now, but being nine years old, I was outside and it was during the day. It wasn't evening. It wasn't early morning. It was during the day. And I was, I was petting the bull and I was being really loud. I was like, I was just mocking the bull, just being the kid. And to the left of the fence line, that fence line goes all the way back into where the property is sectioned off. And on our side, we have woods, but on their side, they just have land. So the tree line was sectioned off. And because of the fence, there was like a trail, like an impromptu trail that was sort of made. And I remember making all this noise and I looked down the trail and there was a huge buck, the biggest buck I've ever seen in my life, mind you, like in person, it was, it was massive. And when I was mocking the or mimicking the the bull and I was just being loud, I looked down the trail and I saw this buck. I saw it and it saw me. And being nine years old, I was I was terrified. This thing was huge, but it stood up. And when it stood up on its hind legs and looked at me, I took off running. Uh, that's the only thing I remember. Um, but it stood up. And as soon as it like stood up and I saw it get taller, I ran away. Uh, and I, I bring this up now because what if what I heard in Arizona and what I saw when I was nine, what if it was possibly a skinwalker? Yeah, that's scary that you mention it. And um, it seems like when people have paranormal experiences, Bigfoot activity, somehow it's all associated and connected, you know, with the paranormal. So just because you have one doesn't mean you're not going to get the other years later. Um, are you sure that it was a buck? Like you saw it good enough to know that's a white tail or do you think it, it did it re- just resemble like a deer, like something with horns? What do you, it, it definitely resembled. Um, uh, what I mainly saw was the rack. It had a, it had a huge rack or antlers. Sorry. Mm, um, okay. I see was, what you mean by like the biggest deer ever. So it was like a moose darn near, like as far as yeah. the rack. Yeah, it, okay. it was, it was. It was big, but Oklahoma doesn't have huge bucks. Um, we have whitetail. It's more of a, a prominent species of deer. And they typically, a full-size male, they usually don't get over like 230. And when I say this thing was huge, it was, the rack was, I don't know. I, I saw it for a brief second, but in my mind, I knew it was pretty big. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's out of the realm of possibility for a buck to get up on its hind legs like that um as far as like does they you know they try to break down the social order in their groups run off younger bucks and they'll get up on their hind legs and fight you know hit each other with their front legs but i don't really hear many stories or see much evidence of bucks just doing that out of the blue especially a big mature buck he doesn't mess around like does or younger bucks if he sees you or has any idea that there's something wrong he is out of there immediately so it's very unusual for a buck to see you and to stand up on its hind legs like that and kind of challenge you so yeah you definitely experienced something unusual whatever it was and it could be possible that it was a wendigo um are there stories from oklahoma of wendigos we so there's a lot of Apache land around us. We have many reservations. Um, my friend Rissa, she lives on an Apache reservation uh, in Apache, Oklahoma. Um, and, I, and I've heard stories of skinwalkers and wendigos, um, but I didn't really start hearing those stories more often until I went to Arizona. Uh, Corbin's friend Ty, he was native and whenever we would bring up that word, he would shut it down. He wouldn't allow us to talk about it. Um, and that, that, that's why I bring that up and ask, because I know I have a lot of supernatural stuff happen to me and some stuff I try to, to kind of piece it into other things that I've experienced, but it's, it's sort of just left hanging because I, I don't know how to piece it together. Um, 
but I, I know that it's not common for bucks to stand up like that. And that's, you know, being nine years old, <laughs> you'd probably be scared of a big buck anyway. So my intuition was just to, to just run. But I, I was thinking possibly if the, the buck heard me just making noises and being loud if it came because it was curious. But when it stood up, I didn't I didn't stop to give it any. <laughs> I didn't wave. I, you know, I didn't stop to see. I, I took off running. Something in my little nine-year-old self just told me to run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it could have been either a big monster buck doing something out of the norm, or it could have been a cryptid creature. You know, um, a lot of us researchers in the Ozarks, we've theorized that the land is cursed. And that's just from activity that we experience. And if you listen to the natives, you know, when they lost a lot of this land, they cursed the land. You know, they lost a lot of family, a lot of members, and it destroyed their lives. So you know the shamans curse this land and even they say that there's phenomenon going on that they can't explain you know you stay out of the woods you don't talk about it you don't go near it it's it is dangerous and it seems to be something that's not holy you know there's something diabolical going on per se and it seems like there's doorways and gateways and this is an explanation for ghost activity ufos aliens bigfoot you know the way they come into our reality physically you know they're actually here but then they disappear never to be seen again so it's almost like our universe is fading into another universe essentially but we can't see it but it's right there and whatever these beings are have access to travel in those means if that makes sense and the ancient people of the day you know we see the great pyramids the mayan temples and all these sacred areas we wonder what the heck were they doing what do they know why do they study all these planets and all this phenomenon why do they believe in all these creatures you know it's the same thing that's happening today and they're just trying to explain it the best they could i'm glad you bring that up man because i was i was telling my brother uh yesterday about how every human culture and in human history has their own depictions of giants uh whether it's in ancient egypt all the way up to you know the nords up in the north every culture that's ever existed has their own depictions of giants and he's like well what's so weird about that i'm like well word of mouth in those days was very rare traveling long distances to get from one place to another was just unheard of uh so people in ancient egypt having their own depictions of giants china having giants uh the middle east it just it doesn't make sense when you look at it from that perspective and i'm glad that you brought that up because i i think that there's there's more depth to everything that we think uh the people that lived before us were very intelligent um they had their own way of worship they had their own way of talking to these things whether it's evil or good um but I, i'm glad you brought that up because i try to tell people that and they're like well bigfoot's just an ape i'm like how do you know like do you have you researched the the occurrences of ufo sightings and bigfoot sightings being like unanimous like being hand in hand and it's just it's a weird topic that a lot of people just don't want to believe in because they're so distracted by everything else in life yeah yeah absolutely there's something strange going on and there's definitely people out there researching the topic underground and privately but it's not we're not being told and i don't think it's like everything we know is necessarily wrong there's just been pieces of science that have been hidden from us and you know i have theories on what it is and you know it's just hard to say well excuse me um are you familiar with david politis in the missing 411 yeah yeah absolutely and you know like i have a theory that you know it's not just bigfoot you know it, that's the reason people go missing you know it's like the triangle phenomenon like the bermuda triangle and um there's all kinds of different triangles around the world, but somehow people, I think, enter into another world never to be seen again, if that makes sense. It makes 100% sense. I, I've bought all his books. I've read all of them. Um, and the, the biggest thing that has stuck out to me is how the, the National Park Service work hand in hand with the FBI to not release any information. And that itself is really weird to me. So it makes me believe that the higher ups, the elite know what's going on, but they mm-hmm. refuse to disclose anything to the public. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's been proven even at the lowest level, you know, being like a city cop, like they believe they are above the law and they don't have to tell us anything. Even though they work for us and they're public servants, you see that even at the lowest level. And you can imagine when you get to this corporate level where you're making billions, you don't have to answer to anyone, even if you're in the government. Yeah, that's a that's a dangerous position. It's a dangerous yeah. position. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, I think this pretty well covers your story and any insight or outlook that I might have had on your encounters. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate you giving me the time to come on and, and talk about my experiences. It makes me feel a lot better knowing that there is a uh, there's a fine knit community that uh, that is able to listen you know and appreciate the things i have to say because regular folk they just they just shrug it off you know and I'm, I'm glad that there's people out there who are willing to listen yeah absolutely and i'm glad we got in contact and you told your story you did a really good job and i hope that if you encounter something else in the future you'll contact me and run it by me oh, absolutely you know i will yes sir all right jacob well We are done for now, and you have yourself an excellent day. You as well, Miguel. Thank you. Mm Mm-hmm. Bye. See ya. Well, that was another terrifying encounter, and I couldn't imagine running into one of these creatures as a kid. All the activity he described sounded like Sasquatch to me. I will try to find some vocalizations that best match Jacob's description to get a better idea of what he heard that day. Oklahoma is a great place to experience Sasquatch activity. The habitat is very lush and diverse. It's a great place to get away from people if you enjoy the great outdoors. I noticed the areas that the Native Americans used to dwell in are areas that are hot with Sasquatch activity today. I'm not sure if there's a connection there. I know the Sasquatch resemble the Native Americans and maybe there is some type of connection. The waterways are always the best place for people to survive, so I'm not surprised. All right, guys, that's all we have for today. And like I said, look out for the new YouTube membership channel coming soon. And I hope you guys consider it. And if you don't, nothing's going to change on the regular channel. This is just in addition for people who want to see more of Sasquatch theory. But anyways, that's all I have for today, and thank you everyone for watching. Be safe in the woods, and stay warm.